Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Jim Olson, Assistant Executive Director of the National Tile Contractors Association, and I want to thank you for attending today. Today's webinar is titled, Take It Outside, From the Rooftop or Driveway to an Outdoor Kitchen and Beyond. Explore the most innovative all-weather solutions in performance and design for the ultimate exterior experience. Our sponsor for this presentation is Dell Tile. And before we continue, I have some business to take care of. Beginning with this webinar, we will be using a, no, a new platform to present um, these webinars. So it's a completely new platform. This platform will allow us to use animation and video, and I hope you all enjoy it. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the questions tab on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are archived and available to watch at any time after the webinars are presented. I will um, provide my email address on the um, question screen, chat screen um, when we begin, and um, you'll be able to uh, send me an email with your request for the archive version at any time after this presentation is completed. If the audio on your computer is poor, there is a number on the invite you were sent that you can call in and listen on your phone. All right, here we go. Today's speaker, Phil Graves, is the Director of Sales for Dell Tile's Exteriors Outdoor Living Program. Phil has over 16 years of experience in decorative paving and walls for residential and commercial outdoor environments. In his previous role, Phil was responsible for outdoor living product sales across the U.S. and was an active member of the Interlocking Concrete Paver Institute. Phil is married with three children and is a 1994 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. And personally, I want to thank you for uh, your service, Phil. Welcome, and uh, it's going to be a great presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Jim. Really appreciate that kind introduction. And uh, hello and welcome to everyone else on the call. Uh, happy holidays. Really appreciate you guys carving out some time to attend this webinar. I know it's a difficult time of the year to break away while we're trying to gear down and get ready for some days off and time to reflect and at the same time gearing up for uh, everything that happens with the hectic season of the holidays. So thanks very much. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Quick little uh, presentation overview, just to let you know what we're going to talk about for the rest of this. It's, it's basically uh, really an overview of uh, hardscaping, decorative outdoor paving, uh, as it pertains to 2CM porcelain tile. Uh, not a lot of technical information here, but we're gonna talk about the market in general. So by the end of the presentation, we just wanna make sure that everyone that's on the call will uh, be able to understand the value of 2CM porcelain pavers for outdoor use. Why is it such a good material? Be familiar with some of the different installation techniques that are uh, in use today in the hardscaping world. And then really probably the meat of the whole thing is understanding the service offering extension potential that exists as a result of this material being introduced to the market. So those of you that have been working on the inside a lot might have an opportunity to expand your service offering into outdoor spaces as well. Quick run through of some four learning objectives. So as we already stated, we're gonna understand the market for outdoor living. What's different about outdoor installations versus indoor installations. Then we're gonna compare and contrast 2CM porcelain versus other decorative outdoor paving materials that have been in use for a long time. We're gonna take a look at real briefly a cost analysis comparing the different hardscape materials. And then uh, just have a quick overview of applications and installation options from a design perspective as well. So number one, we talked about this, let's dive right into it. Look at, look at the pretty pictures. So exterior hardscape surfaces. So hardscaping basically refers to all the solid landscaping materials. It's usually your pavements. So your driveways, walkways, patios, pool decks. Um, decks, like wood decks, elevated decks, most people just call those decks still, but in reality, uh, they are considered hardscaping. It's just the decks were around before a lot of this other decorative material was, uh, but now it's lumped in with the rest of it. 
So hardscaping is really the bones of a landscape design. So when you're thinking about outside, the first thing you want to do is consider how are you going to use the space. And then if you are going to entertain, if you're going to have a cooking area, uh, if you're going to have a conversation pit type area, um, it really defines what the space is going to look like. And then everything else is sprinkled in around it, you know, your plantings, your mulch, your your flowers, whatever it happens to be. So just looking at this picture alone, looks like there's a, a wood deck or a composite deck at the top of the screen that leads to an interlocking concrete paver patio. There's a bar area, so that's some portion of an outdoor kitchen or at least a bar. And then there's that conversation circle that centers around what appears to be an outdoor fireplace. And then you've got a swimming pool with a pool deck around it. So a lot of different elements in one single picture, all considered hardscaping. Just wanted to show you this picture, not a lot to talk about here, except for, you know, there's vertical applications as well. So what you're looking at here is you've got your, probably a natural stone countertop. You've got porcelain tile wood look planks. You've got the stacked stone panels. That's a natural stone veneer. Uh, a lot of different, it looks like there's even a glass mosaic that's sort of a backsplash above that range there. So a lot of different material options for outdoor living. And they're getting to be a lot more uh, sophisticated than they used to be, both uh, especially in just the visual. Um, you can have a much more finished inside style look outdoors now with some of the advances in technology and materials. So what's different about doing work indoors versus outside? So here's a couple or a few conditions on the left side. Indoors, what's the temperature like? It's Ultimately, it's perfect. It's wherever you dial the thermostat is, and that's what the temperature is going to be. So not only perfect, but also constant. Outside, little different story. Obviously, the temperature is highly, highly variable. You can have temperatures all the way up to 110, 120 degrees in the desert areas and obviously down to 50 below up in uh, Minneapolis and other areas like that. And that has a big impact on what kind of material is suitable for use outside. Some of it can't stand the thermal shock. Some of it's not good under freeze-thaw conditions, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, you know, some just can't be that cold. The material can get brittle and fall apart or crack. So what about rainwater? Inside, well, hopefully, hopefully not, right? Hopefully we're not having any rainwater inside. If we do, we most likely have bigger problems in how the floor is going to handle it. But outside, obviously, there's potentially a lot of rainwater. Not only rainwater, but snow and ice as well. And what about slope inside? Unless you're sloping to a drain, uh, there is no slope. It's perfectly level flooring in most cases. Outside, however, because of that rainwater condition, the basic standard is 2% grade away from your structures because you want to get the pavement or you want to get water away from the building and off the pavement. And then freeze-thaw cycles, just like the temperature. Uh, indoors, you don't have any freeze-thaw cycles. Again, if you do have a freeze-thaw or a freezing condition inside, once again, you have a bigger problem. But outside, well, this is kind of an interesting question because where do you live? Do you have freeze-thaw cycles? Looking at this map, you might be surprised to learn that the majority of the country has quite a few freeze-thaw cycles. So if you look, for instance, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, you expect that to have a lot of freeze-thaw cycles. But then take a peek down at Virginia. Almost the entire state has the same amount of freeze-thaw cycles as Minnesota does. It just happens at different times of the year. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, they go into a deep freeze and basically stay there for a few months. So their freeze-thaw cycles are in... November and April, sometimes May, unfortunately. Um, but in Virginia, that's happening throughout December, January, February. And what's the big deal about a freeze-thaw cycle? So when uh, a paving material absorbs water and then it freezes, water, when it freezes, expands by 10%. So when the water freezes and turns to ice, it pushes out against the material that it, it has absorbed into. So the more porous a material that you have, the more damaging freeze-thaw cycles are going to be. Now, look at Denver. Denver's got 125 to 150 freeze-thaw cycles a year. And frankly, Denver can have multiple freeze-thaw cycles in a day. and That can be highly destructive to an absorptive outdoor material, especially when it comes to paving, because the water hits it, soaks into it, it has nowhere to go necessarily. 
and, uh, and then freezes and starts to push out against the material. And every time it pushes out, it makes a little bit bigger void space. So that lets more water in and then it just accelerates the deterioration. Now, talking about those states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, the ones that kind of go into a deep freeze and stay there, they have, however, man-made freeze-thaw cycles in the form of de-icing salts. So you have an ice storm or a snowstorm, you get a bunch of ice on your sidewalk and your steps, you go out there and you sprinkle your de-icing salt down, whatever kind it happens to be. Now you've created a freeze-thaw cycle that wasn't going to otherwise exist because it melts the ice, turns into slush, bunch of that soaks into the pavement and then it freezes again eventually when the salt's all used up and not only does that cause the same problems as the freeze thaw cycle but when the salt is dissolved into that water as it melts the ice the salt gets into the pavement and then that actually crystallizes and grows and, and deteriorates the pavement even faster So let's take a look real quick at what's sort of the potential of the market for hardscapes. Right now, we know uh, from industry surveys that the interlocking concrete paver alone, North American market, is about $900 million annually. So that's sales of material. So that's a bunch of money. And then natural stone, we don't know that one as well because there's so many small outlets for natural stone paving. Um, that there's just no industry association to tie it all together that you can you know, really survey and get solid numbers. But generally, it's considered to be as big or bigger than concrete pavers. So now we're already creeping up on potentially $2 billion. And then there's other materials to consider as well. You've got clay pavers, stamped and stained concrete, which is still decorative paving, but it's a poured concrete. And then, as I said before, we're, now we're lumping in wood and composite decking. And then Porcelain pavers are making an entry into the market. They've been in the U.S. for four or five years now. And as it turns out, because it's such a great paving material for the outdoors, it's the fastest growing of any of those outdoor decorative paving materials. Double-digit growth every year for the last four or five years. Easing on into the second learning objective, we're going to take a look at some different outdoor decorative paving materials and compare them and talk about what characteristics do they have? Why would people choose them? Why would people maybe not select them? So here's just a real quick overview of the things that we're gonna talk about. We're just gonna transition into the next slide and respect everyone's time. Poured concrete being the first, typically the least expensive of all the decorative outdoor paving materials. Now poured concrete can be as simple as a broom finished concrete, your driveway, your standard home builder package, your 10 by 10 back patio, that's just broom finished concrete. Or, in the picture here, it can be stamped and stained for a little bit better aesthetic appearance. I think that there are some other paving options that end up with a superior aesthetic to this, but this is very popular across the entire United States and Canada. Um, people feel like concrete is uh, you know, very sturdy paving material. It's going to be a durable paving material. A couple of things, though, that um, you might not, well, you might want to consider that would lead you maybe to a different material selection. Number one, if you're going to do poured and, and it's going to be decorative, so a stain, uh, you're going to have to put what's called a cure and seal sealer on top of it, and that's going to wear off with time. But what that does is it helps the concrete to cure a little bit more slowly. It slows down the release of the moisture inside the wet concrete. So that makes it stronger, but it also makes it slippery. And then once the sealer wears off, uh, now it's very susceptible to staining because it's quite porous and it absorbs a lot of, a lot of different staining agents. And it's outside, so we're probably going to put staining agents on it, whether we're having a glass of wine, we're grilling and we've got grease spattering from the grill. Who knows what the kids are going to spill when they're out there? Probably a hot dog. Uh, ketchup and mustard is going to get on there. And then obviously your leaf staining, your bird droppings, maybe your dog droppings if you've got a dog. Anyway, there's a lot of things that are going to get into um, outdoor paving that you don't really think about with indoor flooring. Um, and then if you want to protect it from that staining, then you're going to have to throw a sealer on it again, which might make it slippery. And then as with foundations, if you've got frost thieve or frost heave, excuse me, or you've got heavy clay soils that are very expansive when you get a lot of water in them. You're going to get ground movement and then you're going to get cracking of the concrete over time unless it's very, very well constructed concrete, which obviously makes it more expensive. 
Moving on into interlocking concrete pavers. Now, maybe this picture isn't what you think of when you think of concrete pavers, but I selected it to demonstrate that it's actually a very popular paving material because it can come in a lot of different shapes and colors um, and textures, frankly. So uh, they're typically uh, more strong and, and more compressive strength than a poured concrete, usually twice as strong or maybe a little bit more. And they're typically installed over a flexible base, and that would be a compacted aggregate base so that you don't um, worry so much about ground movement if there is some because they're individual paving units that are closely abutted. But basically, the cracks come installed, right? With <laughs> interlocking concrete paver pavement, cracks come installed. So what's the downside? Uh, well, they're made of concrete, obviously, so that means their ingredients are uh, large and small aggregates, a little bit of water bunch of Portland cements, and then pigment for the different various colors you want to get on the surface. And you're going to have a higher concentration of the Portland cement and the pigments on the surface to give it a nice tight face and a vibrant look. But that tends to fade relatively quickly with, with some erosion, with some UV exposure. And as that fades, and as especially the surface or the face of the paver begins to wear, you're starting to lose pigment and then you're starting to expose the aggregate that's underneath. And when you start seeing the aggregate underneath, it really fades the pavement very quickly. So they should be sealed, and that adds a maintenance component. And if, depending on which sealer you choose, it could make uh, some decreased slip and skid resistance to the pavement as well. Clay pavers, not much different than concrete pavers, just a different material being clay versus concrete. Uh, one advantage that they have is they will not fade like a concrete paver will. A disadvantage that they have, though, is it's a very limited number of sizes and shapes available, as you see here. A um, little bit of variability in the dimensional tolerance of the clay paving units can slow down installation because they just don't line up as well. And then uh, they're typically, like concrete pavers, installed over a flexible base. And they also, like concrete pavers, can be installed in a permeable atmosphere. And that means that any water, rainwater, that falls on the surface, rather than running off um, into the surrounding landscape, it freely drains through the joints between the, between the paving units. And then there's a specialty-based structure underneath the pavement that I'm going to describe a little bit later on. Um, but that's an advantage over a poured concrete uh, that you can have more pervious cover on a lot. And then natural stone, lots of different options with natural stone. Obviously, here we've got some large, irregular shapes mm -hmm. real natural look, um, more of a rustic look. What's becoming really popular these days is dimensional cut stone in really large format sizes. So uh, you get sort of that ashlar pattern uh, with various sizes and straight, neat, you know, sort of more modern, contemporary lines. Uh, and then you can also have uh, individual paving units that would be a natural cobblestone that would be kind of like a concrete paver or clay brick paver, the difference being it's going to be a little bit rougher, a little bit more rustic. Natural stone does not fade, but it does come in various levels of porosity. So if you have a really you know, open-faced stone, you can suffer some of that free saw damage relatively quickly. And what people are finding and more and more is that a lot of natural stone decking that's used around pools with saltwater pools, uh, that that natural stone is falling and deteriorating, and especially the coping just falling apart in a lot of applications. So for installation, it can be bonded on concrete, wet set in a mortar bed, or sand set over a flexible base. So a lot of options to use depending on the size of the paving unit and what you want out of the pavement. And then finally, here we've got wood or composite decking. Uh, obviously, it's a great solution for elevated applications. But there's a lot of people that like to put it close to ground as well. And when you start putting it close to the ground, you, you create wet areas underneath the deck. So that can be a breeding ground for mosquitoes, maybe a place for critters to hide out. Um, a lot more maintenance required for natural wood decking than most of these other materials. Um, but even the composite, where you can't really do much to maintain it, it's fades over time, it cups over time, you know, wood rots, it splinters, you can get termites in it. And then finally, if you're going to be outside and 
grilling or have a fire pit nearby, potential fire hazard too. Maybe sparklers on the 4th of July. So we move on now to what the focus of the presentation is, and that's two centimeter porcelain pavers. It frankly, really is the best choice for outdoor paving. You know, it's impervious to staining. You can't even seal it if you wanted to, to try to preserve the look. You know, at the beginning of the uh, webinar, Jim mentioned that I've been in the uh, outdoor living space for the last 16 years. Well, 13 of those years, I worked for a company that manufactured uh, chemical cleaners and sealers, primarily for concrete pavers, but also for natural stone. And five years ago, when I saw the first 2CM porcelain tile, my first reaction was, this is fantastic. It looks so good, I'm going to sell a ton of sealer. And the tile rep looked at me and said, you're not going to sell a drop of sealer on this stuff because it, you won't, it won't accept the sealer. It's not going to stain. It doesn't fade. And uh, I realized right then and there that I was in trouble, but also that the concrete paver guys were in trouble. And luckily, I've now moved over to where I get to take advantage of this opportunity with the 2CM tile. And I'm fully committed and believe that this is easily the best decorative outdoor paving material on the market today. So one of the things about moving outside is we're more worried about slip and skid resistance than we are on the inside. So everything that goes outside in 2CM ought to have, and most of it does meet or exceed a 0.6 DCOF, that's the dynamic coefficient of friction for outdoor slip resistance. And this goes back to talking about some of those other materials, they don't even measure for it. So a natural stone, they're not measuring for the slip and skid resistance and certainly not the sealed uh, stamped and stained concrete pavement. So if you've got a slope on your outdoor pavement and it's slippery, it can be a definite hazard, sometimes even difficult to, to stand up on. I've been in some uh, hotel portico chaises that were heavily sealed and in that little area that gets exposed to the rainwater blowing in, I've seen plenty of people slip and fall on those areas. So it's completely free thaw proof, it's not going to fade, it has a very high breaking strength. By standard, it has to have over a 1,000 pound breaking strength. And with digital imaging, the new technologies available today, we can make it look like anything. So a natural stone, concrete, a wood plank, plaster, it's even, you can even make it look like fabric, almost like outdoor carpeting if you really wanted to. It wouldn't feel like it, but it would look like it. So as a result, it's the most beautiful outdoor paving material that exists. And even better, in some cases, you can have a coordinating indoor tile that is the same size, the same image, the same aesthetic on the top, on the face, and a little smoother feel for indoor use, walking around barefoot or in your socks, and a thinner tile. Um, so lighter, maybe a little bit cost driven out of it. But now you can completely blur that line between indoors and outdoors. So just imagine, if you've got a nice big back patio or pool deck, it's the same exact look as your inside. You've got your sliding doors, or if you're doing really well, maybe a series of pocket doors, and you shove that thing all the way to the side, and now you've just got this seamless transition from the indoors to the out and back again. So uh, I didn't want to do an animation reveal on this one. There's just too many, too many blocks on there. But let's look at real quick some comparative features between the various types of uh, paving materials that we talked about. I didn't put wood or composite on there because it's just not really a, a fair comparison. But if you look all the way down that very left column of features, the one I would draw your eye to, two of them really, but the first one is the water absorption. So to be certified porcelain, it has to absorb less than half a percent. The next closest one, there's two of them on there at 5%. That's 10 times more absorptive than a porcelain tile. So that's what really makes it uh, so many of the other characteristics on that same column, the stain resistance, um, freeze thaw resistance, ice, the icing salt resistance, acid resistance. That's all because none of those, none of those things will absorb into the tile. Um, and then you look at the compressive strength. It hasn't really been a unit of measure in the tile world for a long time, but once you move outside, everybody is boasting on their compressive strength. So the bottom of the totem pole there is uh, cast in place concrete or poured concrete 2500 pounds of pressure per square inch is sort of where the standard begins at a residential level and then you get your pavers clay and concrete they're boasting more than 8000 psi and that's how they describe themselves as superior to poured concrete 
Natural stone, it's really all over the map. It just depends on the stone and the density of it. But look at the compressive strength of porcelain pavers. It's over 30,000 PSI, so it's absolutely incredibly strong. And then what's great about it, at two centimeters thick, it's only nine pounds per square foot. So while an individual tile can be quite heavy, all these other paving materials are much thicker. So if you're trying to get it from the factory to the job site or the distribution yard to the job site, you get more square footage on a truck with porcelain tile, porcelain pavers, than you really do with any of these other materials because the next thinnest one in any of these other materials is probably three centimeters, and most of them are six centimeters up to four inches, five inches thick. So you don't get as much finished square footage on a truck as you do with porcelain tiles. So essentially, more of your money is going to your paving material and less of your money is going to pay for the gas to get it there. So we're gonna ease on over into learning objective three, and this is gonna be a quick one, just a real quick cost analysis comparing various hardscape materials. Look at this picture. That's porcelain, that's not, that's not wood, that's porcelain. Um, so it may have a higher material cost than some other hardscape choices, but certainly not always. Um, a lot of natural stone is going to come at a higher price tag than a porcelain tile. Uh, you know, that popular interlocking concrete paper, it really depends on what the paper looks like and how thick it is because there's quite a broad spectrum of material costs for in the concrete paper world. And since all the large format stuff is, is popular right now in outdoor design, you tend to have to have thicker pavers. You've got more concrete, so that drives up the cost per square foot of that paving unit. But at the end of the day, the superior durability, longer life cycle, it really offsets any of the initial costs you know, that may be higher for porcelain. Again, not necessarily, but really the reason it's so valuable is because it's just the prettiest. It's the best looking material that there is. Kind of an eye chart here, but real quick, if you look at the base level of, of cost is broom finished concrete. We don't really consider it decorative, um, but you know that's sort of the baseline for outdoor paving. But from there, if you look, you've got maybe an interlocking concrete paver and a sand bed at just under 14 bucks a foot installed. And then you know, scoot on down to the bottom of that chart, and we're not that far off. If you're going uh, thin set direct bond or a sand set, with a 2CM tile, just a 24 by 24, sort of the standard, you're only a few bucks higher per square foot. So the, the, the cost difference is not even close in terms of the life cycle value of switching it to a 2CM porcelain. I'm gonna go back to that one just for a second to address some of that information on the side. So where did we come up with these numbers? Uh, we commissioned a third-party independent agency to survey contractors from all around the, the country, different regions. So the West Coast, Phoenix, that's typically a lower install cost. Florida is typically a lower install cost. And then in the middle of the country, Denver, where freeze thaw is a big issue. And uh, you know, the upper Midwest, Chicago land, and then the Northeast as well, which is really where the concrete paver industry first started in the U.S. 40-some-odd years ago and it has a real real stronghold on the market for decorative paving. So these numbers, we didn't just draw them out of a hat, we surveyed contractors from all over the country, actually we commissioned someone else to do it. So it's an independent body, and we find that uh, from an installed cost, we're not out of line, not even remotely, and in some cases, look at natural stone, could be higher. So the fourth and final learning objective that we're gonna cover here, is uh, to talk about the various installation methods because there's a bunch of them. And if you've been uh, a tile setter for a number of years, that still works outside too. Um, but from a hardscaper perspective, and you're talking about maybe using a flexible base, that's an option as well. And then we're going to talk about raised flooring too, which is a rapidly growing application. So real quick, just on design to cover what we've uh, somewhat touched on before. Now, there are some manufacturers of 2CM tile that also have inside or interior versions of the same tile, so you get that seamless transition between the two areas. Um, most 2CM tile has trim pieces, so you know pool copings, stair treads, risers, um, you know various uh, wall caps, 
a lot of different things, uh, landscape edges even, you know, for uh, or landscape curbing even. So there's a lot of uh, trim pieces that can really finish off uh, an outdoor design. And then also some manufacturers of 2CM porcelain have thinner tile porcelain veneers that are totally suitable for outdoor use. They're gonna match or coordinate with field tile and really give you a finished look uh, that's totally coordinated from the flooring um, to the vertical spaces. Included this picture uh, and really kind of included this slide just so I could show this picture too. But it's a great, uh, great visual on that transition between indoor living and outdoor living where it's virtually seamless. You don't even feel the, uh, the difference other than you get the sunshine on you a little bit better when you go outside. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk some about uh, through some of these applications. So bonded on concrete that most people are already familiar with and then laying in grass or sand over a flexible base pedestals, pedestal systems, and then overhead decking too. Um, and a quick note, because a rectified tile is so precision manufactured, it brings along some installation efficiencies as well versus some other materials like a uh, irregular flagstone, for instance, where you're gonna have to have a stonemason with a hammer and a chisel, making sure that your joints aren't getting too big between the paving units. So bonded on concrete, what is the big benefit to bonded on concrete? Well, you can have vehicular traffic, just like you see in the picture here. So now it opens up the opportunity to have well, maybe a hardwood mm -hmm. driveway and garage floor. It could be really neat. Uh, Porta-cachets at hotels. As I said, some of those decorative porta-cachet materials get real slippery. And since a 2CM tile is going to meter exceed 0 0.60 decop, it's a superior paving material to use just for safety factors. Now, if you're going to do it outside and you're in an area where it snows, you might want to consider a snow melt system that's going to be underneath the tile. Those are plentiful, no big deal. It's very similar to uh, radiant heated floors for indoor use. And if you're going to use a, a shovel or a plow on there, a Teflon blade or a plastic snow shovel is the way to go. Just in case there is a little bit of lippage, you don't want to have a steel blade or a steel shovel and, and, and chip the edges, but just a consideration for outdoor paving. Uh, setting and grout materials, they need to be appropriate for the environment. You know, try not to have the grout where it's, you know, a little more absorptive than it ought to be and water's getting into the system and starting to pop the tile when it freezes and expands. I'm not going to go into any technical information on that, though. There are existing archive webinars that describe that. I'm going to list off three of them that I saw real quick. So if you want to come back to this archived webinar when it's over, uh, you can move over to the slide with the car on it and remember which other webinars to look for in the archives. So number one is strategies of exterior tile installation. Number two is opportunities and challenges in exterior tiling. And number three is best practices for installing exterior tile systems. I'm going to move on to the simplest. Uh, installation method for 2CM outdoor tiles, basically stepping stones. So lay it on the grass or sand, it means just that. You just lay it on the grass or on the sand, piece of cake. Um, in this case, you're not really worried about the joint spacing. You can put them as close together as you like, as long as they're not banging into each other. Or you can space it out as much as you like, you know, just for the aesthetic. Um, so why would you want to do this? I mean, it's truly a temporary paving. You could make a path, you know, in your backyard that would uh, last for ages and you'd be happy with the way it looks or you might want to have if you're in a hospitality situation some temporary paving maybe a, a wedding reception on the beach or you know a, a prom dance in the in the courtyard of a nice hotel and you don't want that paving to be there all the time so the nice thing about having only a two centimeter thick large format tile say it's just 24 by 24 you can have over 400 square feet of pavement that you can then put in the storage shed side by side eight square feet of floor space in the shed and it's going to be about two feet high and then you can bring it back out whenever you want so it's completely reusable in this in this application it doesn't require any skilled labor obviously just maybe a halfway decent eyeball if you want the lines to be relatively straight and that's about it but the good news is even though it's only nine pounds a foot Sort of the standard smallest tile is 24 by 24 inches. That's a 36 pound tile. 
So it's not going anywhere once you put it down. And you're not going to have movement. You're not going to roll your ankle on it because it's only two centimeters thick. And then they can get up to you know, 24 by 48. I think the heaviest one I've picked up so far is a 32 by 32. That's a 65 pound tile. When you put it on the ground, it's not going anywhere. In fact, you're not going to be looking forward to picking it back up again either. Now, another installation technique, laying on a flexible base. So this is similar to those uh, clay paver and concrete paver installations that we saw earlier in the presentation. This one, it's still temporary because it's not bonded to anything, but it's considered more permanent because it requires that you excavate out some ground and then you backfill it with whatever base material you're going to use. Um, you don't need any expansion joints. There's no adhesive. With the rectified tile, you can have joints as narrow as one eighth inch, or you can have them as wide as you like for aesthetics or for permeable applications. So for instance, uh, in the photo here, you see it's filled with a clean aggregate or a clean gravel, and clean just means that it's all basically the same size. Whereas uh, if it was dense graded aggregate, you'd have various sizes, maybe from like three quarter inch all the way down to very fine material. Um, and that makes an impervious base. But in this case, if you have clean aggregate under the tile as well, and it becomes free draining, now it's a permeable application and you're getting, you know, zero runoff. Oops, I double, double tap that one. Let's go back. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I don't want to get too technical and there's plenty of resources out there for you. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture that had tile on it that showed a cross section. So this is concrete pavers in this case. Um, but one element you don't need with tile is that curb because of the, you know, the weight of the unit of its, by itself. It's not going to move. Um, you want, you're not going to use it in a vehicular application with porcelain, uh, but you can use it in foot traffic, pedestrian application all day long. Now, the joints are going to be like a number eight or number nine stone, so a clean aggregate, small aggregate. Uh, and then that's going to be a bedding material too. And then underneath the bedding material, you're going to have base material that's going to be a larger stone, typically called a, a number 57 stone, where it's going to be about an inch to three quarters of an inch uh, uniform size. And that's free draining. Underneath that, you're going to want to put a permeable geotextile fabric or a membrane. And the reason for that is you just don't want mixing of your base material with your natural soil that's underneath. Um, and then if you're worried about the joint material washing out or getting on top of the stones, there are actually sealers that you can apply just to the joints that will stabilize that material, stick it together without clogging the system and without uh, negatively impacting the permeability of the system whatsoever. And I put a link there at the bottom of the slide, icpi.org, that's the Interlocking Concrete Paving Institute. Um, that's a great source right now for how to construct these kinds of pavements. And why would why would you want to construct this kind of pavement? Well, I just had a conversation a couple of days ago in Philadelphia. People are, are unhappy with a lot of uh, impervious cover restrictions on residential lots. So if you have a relatively small lot, which seems to be more and more of a trend in suburban areas, and you want to have a relatively big house on it, well, all that roof demonstrates or it, it it comprises impervious cover. So anything that hits the roof is running off. And anything that doesn't get soaked into the ground is running down to the curb and into the storm sewer system. And along with it, it's carrying you know, your fertilizers and whatever contaminants you might have on your driveway. And it taxes the storm system. So if uh, in, in, in those cases, if you've used up most of your impervious cover allowance on the lot, now you can't build a big back patio. Well, if your back patio happens to be a permeable construction, it can be as big as you want because it's not going to run off. So uh, this is a really quickly growing method. In fact, on the concrete paver side, um, a lot of these lot restriction builders are making their driveways out of per, uh, permeable concrete pavers uh, so that it doesn't contribute to eating up the amount that they can have with impervious cover on that lot. And now they're starting to take that to the backyard too, and more and more that's going to be the backyard with uh, porcelain tile. So what's a raised paving system? In this case, we're going to talk about a pedestal system. The nice thing about pedestal systems is now 
if you've got proper slope under the system, and this is typically used right now in commercial applications, uh, top of high-rise buildings, tops of hotels where they want to have more usable outdoor space, entertaining space, maybe a rooftop swimming pool. Well, that roof, even though it's essentially a flat roof, it still has to be sloped to drain water off of it. If you put a pedestal system on top, now the joints remain open. There's nothing in the joints whatsoever. Um, any rainwater that hits it is going to go through the joints and hit the roof and drain. But you can actually, using the height adjustable pedals, have pedestals, have a perfectly flat outdoor roof you know, where it's great for entertaining. You're not worried about the, the furniture being tilted or anything. Um, you know, very stable and yet free draining. So it really is an opportunity to create a functional space where otherwise you wouldn't be able to because you've got conduit and electrical and who knows what else uh, laying on top of that roof. Now that's all easily concealed underneath this raised floor. And good news is it's also easily accessible because these tiles aren't bonded to anything. They're just sitting on top of the pedestals. So grab a suction cup, stick it on there, lift up the tile, and you've got access to everything underneath. And this isn't new. Just because outdoor porcelain is relatively new, pedestal systems have been around for a long time. Concrete and natural stone have dominated it, primarily concrete. But porcelain is catching up really, really rapidly for the obvious reasons. Primarily, it's prettier than the other stuff. Um, but then from a maintenance perspective, it's easier. And from an access perspective, it's lighter per unit. Let you come back and look at this one at your leisure. Um, going to be rehashed of what I talked about for the most part. Um, but one of the nice things about this that I didn't mention, those bottom two bullets, uh, they can absorb a little bit of movement. And if it moves too much where you get some lippage, well, just lift up the tile, adjust the pedestal, and lay it back down. And it's fine again. And then if you want to remodel it or change the look up a little bit or maybe do some inlays with some different looks, some wood looks inside, some stone looks maybe, make it look like an outdoor area rug. Um, you can lift up the tiles and move them off to the side, use them for something else, and replace them. There's no demo because it's not a bonded application. And take a look at this, how beautiful the result is. So here you see a couple of different color tiles on there, and they made, a, they made an inlay to give some visual appeal to the design. And this is a pool deck in Naples, Florida. That's on a pedestal system over a parking garage. You can see they've even got some artificial turf on there to make it look more natural. So really a beautiful result and gaining in popularity like crazy. And now here's something that's really exciting, this uh, elevated decking. So for the first time, now you can have a porcelain deck off the back of your house. So think about this. You've got a one-story house. You've got a slope yard. So from the driveway, you go in, you're on the top story. But because the yard is sloped, you have a walkout basement out back. And so now you want to throw a deck off the back of your, what's essentially the second story in the backyard, but it's your ground floor from the front. Now you can have your tile indoors slide right out the patio door onto your raised deck with the exact same look. And even better, it can match the walkout basement patio too. So a completely harmonious design with all the same paving. Um, and then surprisingly, uh, the total installation costs honestly, is at or frequently a little bit below a composite deck like a Trex or an Azex, some of the more popular brands on the market. And then because of the engineering of these plastic grates that you see there, uh, there's absolute zero worry about, uh, about breakthrough. So now you can have a wood look even, elevated deck instead of a wood deck, and you can put your grill on it and you can cook on it. And you're never going to have to sand it. You're never going to have to stain it. Kids aren't going to get a splinter from it when they're running around barefoot. So it's a, a really fantastic option for design and construction that hasn't existed before. So to wrap it all up, I mean, I, as I said earlier, I'm a true believer in the product for decorative outdoor paving. And it is easily the prettiest material. And on top of that, it's also the toughest. So it's pretty and it's tough. What's not to like about that? You don't, you don't feel it. It's not going to stain. It won't scratch. One thing I didn't even mention earlier, it won't scratch. Porcelain tile is a number eight on the Mohs scale. You know what's number 10? A diamond. 
So go ahead and drag your steel lawn furniture across it as much as you want. It's going to be fine. Can't say that about most natural stones or concrete pavers or certainly not stamped and stained concrete that's really soft. Uh, so it's a fantastic, fantastic material. And, and I'm about to turn it over back to Jim and then open it up for questions. But I just want to say one more time, you know, I really appreciate you guys all taking some time out to learn about this. You know, consider the potential that exists out there. There's a lot of space out there. Um, and people are wanting to move their living outdoors and they want to have it as low maintenance, but still as good looking as possible. So there's tremendous, tremendous business opportunity out there. And we, we see that the market's already over a, a billion dollars annually. And so there's an opportunity to take a, a piece of that and frankly, to grow it even. So in closing, uh, just thanks again for showing up and, uh, next couple of weeks are filled with holidays a little bit of time to reflect, hopefully spend some time with family and friends. And uh, I hope everyone here has a great holiday season, a Merry Christmas, and and carries through to the new year and has a tremendously successful year next year. So thanks again. Jim, I'll turn it back over to you. Bill, thank you. Fantastic uh, presentation. Lots of information uh, for uh, NTCA members, another uh, avenue to uh, gain market share and uh, get business. Um, great for designers, architects out there. It's uh, great, and you did a fantastic job on pres presenting this, Bill. I want to thank you and Daltow for everything. Um, at this point, we don't have any questions, Bill, believe it or not, but we've got a few people saying thank you and that you had a good presentation. So I want to uh, also, just like Bill mentioned to everybody, happy holidays, enjoy your time off with family and friends, and uh, Let's look at uh, some of these uh, exterior options in uh, 2020. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim.